It occurred during the monumental tragedy of the Great Depression and was then virtually obliterated from general memory by the carnage of the 1938 hurricane. Yet the flood of 1936 stands as the greatest natural disaster ever to hit Hartford and other towns arrayed along the Connecticut River. Over the span of a week, the river rose, then fell, and then rose again to unprecedented heights. Eventually, one-fifth of Hartford was underwater. 10,000 people were forced from their homes along the river from Windsor to Middletown. Almost 20% of the population of Glastonbury became refugees. During the flood of 1936, the entire life of Hartford seemed almost dead, one observer remarked at the time. But despite the demoralizing impact of the flood, Greater Hartford, Middletown, the Farmington Valley, and other places would recover. For 300 years, observational records had been kept on Connecticut River water levels. Prior to 1936, the highest crest stage around Hartford had been recorded in May 1854, when the river rose 29.8 feet above normal. That flood prompted gun manufacturer Samuel Colt to build 32-foot-high dikes near his armory to protect it and the surrounding south meadows of Hartford from the river. The dikes withstood more than 100 floods between 1854 and 1936, including one in 1927 that reached a record 29 feet. The South Meadows appeared to be safe from even the most catastrophic 100-year floods. Municipal dikes further protected the city and were in some places higher than Colts. The winter of 1935-36 was not unusual. The Connecticut River Valley from New Hampshire and Vermont to southern New England was covered by a softening snowpack of about 25 inches when a late winter thaw began in early March. Ice on the river began to break apart in the northern states. Fueled by warm, torrential rains and runoff from snow melting on the mountains, the headwaters of the Connecticut River went on a rampage and headed south. On March 11th, in southern New England, the rain and melting snow and ice dramatically increased the flow of water into tributaries of the Connecticut River. The Park River in Hartford became the first to jump its banks. The ensuing flood covered Bushnell Park. Dikes held the Connecticut River in check at a flood level of 24 feet. Alarms over an impending flood dissipated as the river receded to its normal seasonal levels. Yet the rain pelted the region unceasingly. The headwaters of the Connecticut River freshened by downpours in the north, flooded towns throughout the valley in New Hampshire and Vermont. The crest was moving fast to the south, but weather forecasters said on March 17th that they didn't expect the Connecticut River to rise materially in the Hartford area unless it continued to rain. It did. As a drenching rain fell on the morning of March 18th, shrill factory whistles and fire department alarms went off in New Hartford, a small town to the west of Hartford, at 7.50 a.m. The Greenwoods Pond Dam on the west branch of the Farmington River had been breached and a surge of water was heading toward the village. Residents scrambled to safety. The dam break signaled the start of the Great Flood of 1936. Shaken by the collapse of the dam and persistent rain, state officials urge people living along the banks of the Connecticut River to leave their homes and head for safety. The Red Cross and other relief organizations mobilized. The National Guard, Naval Militia, State Police, and ordinary citizens took to boats to rescue people. On March 19th, the Connecticut River rose at a rate of nearly six inches an hour. 
At 10 a.m., city officials announced that the bridge connecting Hartford and East Hartford would be closed by the end of the day because the turbulent water had weakened an abutment. Workers left their jobs by the thousands to cross the bridge. A traffic jam lasted for hours. Coast Guard signalers used flags to communicate messages across the span. The river, meanwhile, kept rising. It would surpass 1927's record flood level of 29 feet and continue to rise unabated throughout the night. I was a student then at college, and I was coming home for the, uh, for the weekend by train. And I got off the, uh, the train at the Union Station, and the water was up to the sill leading into the station. You had to step off into water, actually, to, to leave the station. I remember looking up uh, Asylum Street toward the Bond Hotel, and there were rowboats going in and out of the hotel, taking guests in and out. I just couldn't believe the, the level of water that was uh, in the street there. Preparing for the next day's edition, a Hartford Current editor wrote a line that simply stated the obvious. Hartford is at grips this morning with the worst Connecticut River flood in its history. Then the dikes broke. At 11 p.m., a portion of Colts Dyke was undermined and then breached by the surging Connecticut River. Colts Factory, dozens of other plants, and homes in the South Meadows were now underwater, even topping the roofs of airplane hangars at Brainerd Field. At 2 a.m. on Friday, a second portion of the dike collapsed, unleashing a 20-foot-high wall of water over the meadows and a squatter's village in Columbia Gardens. With a roar, the flood hurtled down on them, ripping the frail dwellings off the ground and tumbling them like handfuls of dice. Screams pierced even the thunder of the waters. People ran in all directions, dragging stumbling children in mad confusion. T.W. Parker, The Hartford Current.